Tonight's Magha Puja. We're commemorating an event that happened in the first year after the Buddha's awakening. It was on the afternoon of the full moon day of Magha, the month that corresponds to February or March, that 1,250 of the Buddha's Arahan disciples all came to meet without having made any prearrangement. And the Buddha was about to send them off to teach. Now, these were probably the thousand arahants who had listened to the fire sermon, and the 250 arahants who had come with Moggallana and Saributta. So they'd gained awakening with a minimum amount of teaching, but now they're about to teach others. And the Buddha wanted to give them a full account, from the most basic up to the more advanced teachings. We don't have a record of the whole sermon that he gave that afternoon, but we do have some verses that came at the end as a memory device. The most famous of the verses is Sambhabhabhasa Akaranang Gusara Subha Sambhara Sajjata Bariyora Banang Etang Bhutana Sasanang. Not doing any evil, accomplishing what is skillful. The cleansing of the mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. Of course, the Arahants already knew this as a general principle, but it was good to hear it. As Ajahn Mahabhu once said, they were celebrating their attainment. And it's good to look into that verse. This is a day in which we're celebrating the Sangha and the Dhamma. We have three main events out of the year, Magabuja, Visakabuja, Asalabuja. Visakabuja is the day of the Buddha. As for Asalabuja, it's the day in which the Buddha gave his first Dharma talk, and we had the first member of the Noble Sangha. And it was the day when the Buddha proved that he was a fully attained Buddha, and one who not only could attain awakening on his own, but also could teach the way to others. In that sense, Asala Puja is a day for all three of the members of the Triple Gem. Magha Puja, we're told, is the day of the Sangha, but it's also a day of the Dhamma. Because without the Dhamma, there wouldn't be the Sangha. Without the Sangha to carry on the Dhamma, we wouldn't have it. So they always go together. And so what was that Dhamma? Of course, avoiding all evil, anything that is unskillful, in thought, word, or deed. You try to avoid. You don't say, well, I have enough goodness already in me that I can afford to be lenient on some things, in other words, to be unskillful in some areas. But who wants pain in any situation? Who wants suffering in any situation? When you really have seen the Dharma, you realize that you don't want to do anything that would be unskillful, anything that would be harmful. That's where you got on the path. As for developing skillfulness fully, you develop your virtue, you develop your generosity, and you train the mind in meditation. Specifically, you train the mind in the Brahma Viharas. This is kusala, or skillfulness, leading to rebirth, a good rebirth. With generosity, you're, you can be generous with your material things, you can be generous with your time, with your energy, with your knowledge, with your forgiveness. As for virtue, you hold to the five precepts. You don't kill, steal, engage in illicit sex, engage in lying, taking intoxicants. And in the development of goodwill, you try to develop goodwill for all, without exception. Because you realize if you have ill will for anybody at all, you're going to act in unskillful ways based on that ill will, and that then becomes your karma. So you don't think about whether someone deserves your goodwill or doesn't deserve your goodwill. You're generous with your goodwill. 
fact, there are ways in you can, which you can see that all three of these forms of making merit, doing what is skillful, generosity, virtue, development of goodwill, are forms of generosity. With virtue, you're giving safety to everybody. With the development of goodwill, you're giving your good intentions. Things that are free. Now, people sometimes look down on you for observing the precepts, or may think that you're weak because you're developing goodwill for even for people who have harmed you. But you don't let their opinion sway you. You realize that what matters is the goodness of your actions. But then the Buddha goes beyond that, the cleansing of the mind, which suggests that here he's talking about more than simple skillfulness. In fact, you could say this is the part that goes beyond skillfulness, or you could say it's skillfulness of a very special kind. After all, when the Buddha was searching for nirvana, he kept framing his search as the search for what is skillful. And here, of course, is skillful in the ultimate degree. When we think about skillfulness, we think about that question the Buddha has you ask at the to develop discernment, what will be for my long-term welfare and happiness? Now that long-term could be long-term in samsara. But here is, you go beyond that to a higher level of skill, long-term in the sense of not changing at all, because it's outside of time. In this case, you heighten the way in which you practice your generosity and your virtue and your meditation. In terms of generosity, you look at your motivation. Instead of doing good things, giving away good things in hopes of getting good things back, you think less about the things and more about the quality of the mind that you're developing as you develop generosity. It's a spacious mind. It's good for the mind. It feels good. The mind becomes serene. You want to get it to the point where it's simply an ornament for the mind. In other words, you don't need to feed on your internal rewards of generosity. It's just a natural expression of the mind. It's gained awakening and sees that generosity is a good thing. It doesn't even have to think about the fact that it's a good thing. It's just natural to that state of mind. We're talking about a mind of a non-returner here. As for virtue, heightened virtue relates to the, the virtues of a stream enter, virtues that are pleasing or appealing to the noble ones. They're untorn, unbroken, unsplattered. In other words, you really hold to the five precepts. But the way you hold them is qualified in two ways. On the one hand, they say you practice virtue in a way that's liberating, conducive to concentration. In other words, even, even though you are scrupulous in following the precepts, you're not tied up in your scruples, because you realize that virtue is a matter of your intentions. And if you're clear about your intentions, then that kind of virtue really is conducive to concentration, it really is liberating. There's another passage where the Buddha says, you, you are virtuous. But you're not made of your virtue. In other words, you don't have to take pride in your virtue. You don't have to make it part of your self-identity. It's simply a natural expression of what you see has to be done. You don't think about how you are a better person than others who don't observe the precepts. You're just that clear about your own intentions that you're doing this for the sake of, of liberation for the sake of developing good qualities of the mind. Because after all, what kind of virtue is conducive to concentration? One where you really are mindful to keep your precept in mind. You really are alert to your intentions and your actions, and you're ardent in doing this well. Because those are the three qualities you need in order to get the mind to settle down. And then finally, meditation. You meditate not simply to give the mind a good place to stay, 
but you're developing both tranquility and insight as you get the mind into concentration. You try to understand what you're doing in terms of bodily fabrication, the way you breathe, verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself, mental fabrication, the perceptions and feelings you apply to the meditation, the perceptions that hold the breath or help you hold the breath in mind, how you picture the breath to yourself, the way it either originates outside and comes into the body, or the breath that originates in the body itself. And sometimes it seems like it originates at certain centers in the body. Other times it seems like every cell is a spot where the breath originates. And you hold a perception that calms the mind. You're clear about your perceptions. And you're clear about how you relate to the feelings that come. There's a feeling of ease, which you allow to spread through the body, saturate the body. But you don't leave the breath. You don't let the pleasure that comes from the concentration overwhelm the mind. You let it do its work on its own, as you keep on doing your work. And then when the mind is firmly settled in, then as the Buddha says, you step back. The image he gives is of a person sitting looking at someone lying down, or a person standing looking at someone sitting. You step back and observe your mind in concentration. to see that it, too, is fabricated. You do this for the sake of going beyond the concentration itself, because you realize that as long as you stay in samsara, in this running around that we do, no matter how, how good it gets, you can always fall. It's always uncertain. You never know when a trap door is going to open up beneath you. And you don't know what's below the trapdoor to receive you. So seeing how dangerous time is, how dangerous fabrications are, you want to go beyond that. This is where the Buddha says you start looking at the concentration itself as aggregates, and perceiving them as inconstant, stressful, not self, alien, an arrow, a disease and emptiness, whatever perception allows you to realize, okay, this too has its drawbacks and you want something better. When you develop a sense of disenchantment with the concentration and look for something unfabricated, that's when you've really cleansed the mind taking it to a higher level of skillfulness. The skillfulness that the Buddha himself was looking for. So these are the teachings. This is, this, as I say, the heart of the Buddha's teachings. And we have events like this, regular times of the year, to remind ourselves of the people who've found this practice that we're practicing, and to think of all the people in the intervening years who've passed it on to us. It's their gift to us, and it's the kind of gift where you pass it on by using it well. So as with all these events. Bhusaka Bhujha, Asalha Bhujha, Maga Bhujha. We pay homage to the Buddha and to his disciples in the way that the Buddha prays the most, which is through the practice, avoiding every kind of evil, developing skillfulness, and then taking that skillfulness to a higher level where it cleanses the mind. That's the best way that we show our gratitude.